The Gospel of John, chapter 1. I'll be reading from the New King James Translation. Last time we finished in verse 14. And for context, I'll pick up at verse 14 and read through verse 18. Uh, speaking of Jesus, the Christ, verse 14 begins, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This is he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Now, last week, we talked about why God came to us in human form. There's a lot of reasons, and, and one of those reasons was covered in the verse 14 that we, we had read. That is, the Word, Jesus, came in the flesh so that humans could witness and get a glimpse of the glory of God, full of grace and truth. You know, this, this is fantastic news. Um, God took on this human form, and it was happening in a small town, I mean, small country in, in the Middle East, and the problem here was that it, there's no publicity for it. Um, that was 2,000 years ago. I mean, there wasn't social media at the time, uh, email, Fox News, uh, radio stations. Uh, there weren't even telephones or newspapers at that time. Uh, now, we also know CNN wouldn't cover a story about God unless it was a scandal, right? So they, they didn't even cover this. Okay, that's a joke. But, you know, there wasn't television either at the time. So how would people know when the Messiah would be revealed and God's salvation would be known? This is a problem. That was God's problem at the time, right? Well, fortunately, people knew that the, in the Hebrew Scriptures, people that knew the Hebrew Scriptures didn't have to be left in the dark. Isaiah chapter 40 told them, Comfort ye, this is verses 1 through 5, I believe. Yes. Uh, comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for God, for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. Their crooked places shall be made straight and rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be re revealed and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. That and, of course, many other prophecies. But this specific one applies to what we're talking about today. What a comfort these words were back then. And they still are for us today. Now, give a little homework for you. Okay? We don't, we don't end our Bible study at uh, you know, 1045 on Sundays and not look at it again until 10 o'clock the next week. So uh, jot down Isaiah chapter 40. Read through that whole chapter. It reveals a lot of mysteries about what's going to happen, what, what was to happen with the Messiah. So, as we saw when we studied verses 6 and 7 um, a few weeks ago, John the baptizer was supernaturally filled with the Holy Spirit for this purpose. And he fulfilled specific parts of this pro prophecy uh, to be a witness of the coming Christ, God's Messiah. Later on, we'll see in the Gospel of John, once that purpose was completed, then and only then was John set free from this life to go on to his eternal reward. If you'll remember when John the Baptizer was introduced, we studied how his father was a Jewish priest. And I believe that John also studied the Hebrew scriptures. And, and he realized as he read those and as, he, and as he saw what was going on in Israel, he realized how far people had strayed from God. It probably broke his heart to see that. And he, he preached boldly to everyone from the lowest peasant to the, the richest rulers and kings that they needed to repent from their evil and prepare their hearts from the kingdom of God. Now next week we'll get into more specifics about what he said, how he did that, um, but we'll see where he had a highly successful ministry. We would consider that. Multitudes of people repented and prepared themselves for the kingdom of God. His message seemed to reach all of Israel and in fact uh, we know 
it reached to the highest places, and some of those that he preached to were very evil. Men that we talked about before loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And yes, they wanted John out of the picture. And it wasn't going to happen. Okay? John wasn't going to be out of the picture until his God-given mission was completed. This gives us a life lesson today. And the life lesson is God has an incredible plan for your life and will be with you to accomplish his purpose through you. God has an incredible plan for your life and will be with you to accomplish his purpose through you. You know God has a purpose for your life as well? It may not be to witness, uh, as a witness that turns the entire nation around, but whatever it is, he is willing to give you the power to accomplish great things in your life until that purpose is fulfilled. And honestly, most of the purpose for that is right in the pages of the Bible. You don't have to, you know, I, when I was young, a lot of young people were saying, what is God's will for my life? What does God want for my life? And it's like, read the Bible. It's there. Yeah, I've read that. Well, keep reading it if you don't know <laughs> until it sinks in. Now, we also talked uh, in, in, uh, a few weeks ago about Luke, the prophecy in Luke 1 that was given by the Holy Spirit through John's father's Zacharias. So we're starting to see that fulfilled in the scripture today. And it's important to know that the first 18 verses that we've been going through in the book of John are kind of a flyover. It's a, a broad image of what we're going to see throughout the book of John. And uh, more details will be filled in and will follow as we continue through it. So you'll see that the author of this gospel, the apostle John, assumes that the reader already had a, has a general knowledge of the people and, and events referred to, and he fills in some more of the spiritual aspects of what was going on rather than the details, uh, some of the other details that the other gospel writers put in. And that would explain why verse 15 says, John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This is he of whom I said, He who comes before me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Okay? It doesn't seem to make sense, does it? Sounds like he's saying Jesus was born after me, but he's greater than me because he was actually born before me. And yes, that is exactly what he's saying. And if you've been uh, with us each week, you'll see how that makes perfect sense. Uh, if not, take a look at the previous teachings. You'll understand. But let's keep going because uh, John got it. He, he understood that Jesus was greater than him. Uh, verses 16 and 17 say... And of his fullness, and this is the word, or Christ, of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. When I was in school, it's been a while, but I don't think it's changed. Um, the term grace for grace is not one that I heard a lot. I, I didn't hear it a lot at work either, you know. Great, hey, how are things going? Oh man, I'm getting grace for grace. What? So when I see something like that, I've got to dig and find out what it is. So uh, let's take a moment digging here. I, I actually uh, got stuck here. Sometimes I get stuck and, and I look through 50 different translations of this verse to find out what it said. And only about one in five of the, the different translations actually say grace for grace. Um, and there's no other place in the entire Bible that it has this phrase. Um, so it's got to be important though, or else it wouldn't be in God's word. So here is, um, here's a little of the results of my, uh, my research. Um, you know, it's like, what is grace? Now I, my Sunday school, how, how many of y'all know what is grace? America. There you go. That's exactly what my Sunday school answer is. I mean, that's correct. It's absolutely right. Undeserved favor, getting good from God that we don't deserve. Um, and that's kind of in contrast to mercy which is not getting the bad things we do deserve. So the grace and mercy we hear a lot about. But there's a deepness in God's grace that goes, goes far beyond the simple answer that, that we learned when we were young. Uh, so here are some of the definitions from the context of other scriptures. Um, favor, kindness, friendship, God's forgiveness, the gospel as distinguished from the law, gifts freely bestowed by God, and the glory of God revealed. That's kind of a definition uh, by looking at other scriptures that include the word grace. 
And then some of the alternate translations of grace for grace say, say these things. Grace upon grace. Okay? One blessing after another. Now that I can see God doing. <laughs> Makes it a little closer. Grace in our lives because of his grace. Okay, we show grace because he shows grace. More and more blessings. Blessings heaped upon us. Blessing upon blessing. Grace in place of grace already given. I don't know, I get the, that one I just caused me to think, okay, we leak grace, right? Or we should. We should serve God's grace to others, and so we need more grace to, to give out. So God keeps providing that. Uh, grace beyond our imagination. So much kindness and grace over against grace. Kind of wearing that word out, but you know what? You can't wear, the, you can't wear out God's grace. Um, now how would, so how would these words, uh, how, how would the verses read as a writer intended to get them across? Again, I, I like the amplified version, and, and I'm going to read what that says in these two verses. For out of his fullness and abundance, we have all received, we have all had a share, and we were all supplied with one grace after another, and spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing, and even favor upon favor, and gift heaped upon gift. That pretty much covers that. For while the law was given through Moses, grace, unearned, undeserved favor, and spiritual blessing, and truth came through Jesus Christ. A lot of good stuff there. So our life lesson for us today is God's grace is unlimited and is available in our lives. God's grace is unlimited and available in our lives. Now, does that mean that God's laws don't have grace and truth? No. no. Or that lawlessness, there's lawlessness in Jesus Christ. We don't need law because of Jesus. Of course not. But there's obviously, obviously a contrast and a, and a blending. Um, brothers, we talked about earlier, the, the uh, Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament, the law, all that blends together. And when you put them together, you see um, what happens. Jesus in Matthew 5 said, verse 17 and 18, don't think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Now, this was, this was said during the, what we hear of as the Sermon on the Mount. All these people surrounding Jesus, he's teaching, and these people are thinking, here's the Messiah, he's going you know, to release us from all of our bondage, he's going to overthrow the government, um, he's going to release us from all the tyranny in the world, things will be great. And, and then he says, I'm not here to destroy the law. And all of a sudden their hearts sink. I'm just thinking if I'm there as, a, as an observer. Uh, see, most people going about their daily lives, they, they may not have been aware of all of the 613 commandments that were in the Torah, but they tried to. They tried to, to learn. They tried to learn from the, the scribes and the Pharisees, their leaders who, who were to teach them to them. But the law of Moses, um, I mean, it covered everything in, in Jewish society. Uh, spiritual, business, your diet, uh, taxes, governments, crime, really punishment. Just about everything was covered by those six, 613 commandments in the Torah. But at the same time, it wasn't just the Torah's laws, but also the clarifications and interpretations and court rulings and expansions of these laws that became so very burdensome. For example, in our country, we are under a law of the United States. It doesn't cover our diets. It doesn't, well, some of it does now, <laughs> but it doesn't cover our, our spirituality usually, uh, but it covers you know, a lot of the, the civic things. And uh, the supreme law of our land is the Constitution of the United States. It was originally written, I'm sure you all have seen copies of it, it written and signed on four pages of parchment. Four pages. Okay, that's kind of a, a re relating to the 613 laws that, that God had given in the, uh, in the Torah. Well, now with the expansions that we call amendments, it's actually gone about twice that large. But still, it's, that would be manageable for most people to understand. But then comes the rest of it. You can't just go out of the Constitution. There are over 3,000 pages in documents that summarize what the Supreme Court has ruled on how each one of those 
uh, words in the Constitution apply to government actions. And then on top of that, Congress has passed, uh, since they started, over 30,000 specific laws beyond the Constitution that just the federal government has enacted. Most of those laws have multiple commandments in them, uh, so to speak. For example, I checked last week, one of the last uh, bills to pass, uh, October 1st, and uh, passed the House H.R. 925. It consisted of more than 2,000 pages of laws, of rules, of commands. That's just one of the 30,000 laws, 30,000 plus laws that our country has. Now, if that passes the Senate and becomes the law, there's no telling how many specific regulations will come out of that, each one of those uh, commandments or those laws. But brothers and sisters, it's mind-blowing, literally mind-blowing for us to try to figure it out. Um, we're less than 250 years old, uh, not even close to the age of the Jewish nation during Jesus' time. And like the people during Jesus' time, we do expect the lawyers and the judges of our society, the scribes and Pharisees, so to speak, the people uh, to follow all the commandments and go along with all of their regulations. I, I am going somewhere with this, okay? So ju just imagine all of these things that, that you're expected to know or that you have to follow and that actually the scribes and Pharisees were, you know, were, were endeavoring to follow and, and uh, were the righteous people and the common people were thinking they were gonna finally be free of those rules and probably the Roman laws too. And Jesus had just told them that Nope, you know, that I'm not going to abolish that. I'm going to fulfill that. They're thinking, what does that mean, him fulfilling it? And then all of a sudden they get this massive curveball in Matthew 5.20 that says, For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And all of a sudden, it's like, these are the most righteous people there are, the scribes and Pharisees, and unless you're better than that, there ain't no way you're getting into heaven. At that point, I'm sure their hearts were like, no way, no way, we can't, we can't do this. This is impossible. But then he explained what righteousness really meant in the lives of people. It's not just what you do outwardly in public that makes you righteous. It's the condition of your heart, your attitudes. He taught them how to be truly righteous and how to gain true riches. Um, and, and, you know, the, the examples that we hear specifically are, you know, uh, about, about adultery. If you have, not only if you don't commit adultery, that, that, I mean, if you commit adultery, that's wrong. But if you lust after someone else in your heart, that's wrong. And I, again, you know, it's, it's a higher standard, but it's a standard that God expected to start with, but was not embodied in those laws. So it's a fa it's fascinating comparison. You can jot this on your homework again, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Think about and meditate on these things about the contrast between what the people had come through, what they were expecting when they went, came to Jesus, and then what Jesus laid down and said, this is how I expect you to live. This is how God wants you to live. Uh, really fascinating study. So John, 16, John 1, 16 and 17 are intentionally comparing the law that God brought through man, through Moses, against what God himself brought in person through Jesus. And it's a crucial comparison. The concept of law is easy to understand. I mean, our kids, when they're young, they, they catch it by the time they're, hopefully by the time they're two years old, no or yes. Uh, our pets understand. Might have a, have a little newspaper to help them along with it, but our pets understand these things. And, uh, but grace, is something that Jesus brought. Grace is so much deeper, so much more to God's grace. Uh, so many wonderful purposes. You can literally grow in grace an entire lifetime. Uh, my brother David, I think you said you were 80 years old. Uh, my dad is 85 years old, and I see him growing in grace almost every day. And, uh, and God is just continually pouring out favor and blessings in our lives. Now, who wouldn't want that? So let's pursue that grace. That's what Jesus brings in our lives. That's what we want to share with others. If we don't show that, if we don't share that with others, uh, we need to adjust our lives and get back into, uh, into God's grace. And ask him for more of his grace in your life. Our life lesson is that as we grow in grace every day of our lives, his grace will overflow to others. As we grow in grace every day of our lives, His grace will overflow to others. 
Now, uh, time slipping away. I'd, I'd like to get into the ministry, more details of John the Baptizer today, and um, Lord willing, I'll jump right into a lot of cool stuff on that right at the beginning of next week. Uh, but we'll finish up the Apostle John's overview today with verse 18. Verse 18 says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Now, no one has seen God. If no one has seen God, does, does He really exist? Is He hiding from us somewhere? Is He so small that we'd be amused? Um, weird things flash through my mind. I mean, y any of y'all ever seen Star Wars and seen this little green creature about two and a half feet tall? Yoda. It was supposed to be such a great wisdom. And uh, the guy that went in to see him, you know, was just blown away. He kind of la almost laughed at him because he was so small. I'm wondering, if, do people think that God's just, you know, some little creature? And Well, maybe, maybe they'd laugh at it. Or maybe he's so big. There's no way we can get him into our view. Maybe when we look up in the sky and the entire universe that we see out there, maybe that's just a tiny portion of the size of God and we don't even know it. Maybe that's the back of his shirt. I mean, you know, we, we don't know that as, as mere mortals. So, you know, there's something else going on. Why can't we see God? And why did Jesus come? Well, let's take a look at a few verses about God. In 1 Timothy 1.17, says, now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever. Amen. And we're just going to list off some of the things that, uh, from these verses. God, number one, he is king. Number two, he's eternal. Number three, he is immortal. Number four, he is invisible, not able to be seen. Okay? Not able to be seen. He is the only one who is truly wise. He always deserves honor and glory forever. 1 Timothy 6, 15 to 16 says, He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in an unapproachable light, whom, man has, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Well, we learn a few more things about God here. He is the potentate, which means he has unlimited power and authority. Number eight, he is not only king, but he is the king over all kings. Number nine, he is, not only, he is the Lord of lords or the master over all masters. Number 10, no man has seen him or even can see him. Again, you don't see it. Number 11, he is surrounded by unapproachable light. That starts to open things up a bit. In Exodus 33, 20, uh, God told Moses, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. So that adds verse 12. Looking at God's faith is lethal. Okay? At least for humans. So now we're getting somewhere. His power, his light, his energy is so incredible that it would immediately kill a human. Interesting. Uh, but that wasn't a problem for God. This was actually intentional. Because in Deuteronomy, he created us. Deuteronomy 4, it says... Uh, verse 12, it says, And the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of the words, but saw no form. You only heard a voice. 15, take careful, for you to heed, take careful heed to yourselves, for you saw no form when the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire, lest you act corruptly and make for yourselves a carved image of any figure. Again, 20, verse 23, Take heed for yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of your Lord, which he had made with you, and make for yourselves a carved image in the form of anything which the Lord your God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Yes, God knew man well enough to know that if he saw God, what would he do? He would take an image. He would try to carve an image or... You know, take a camera and take a picture of them and, and uh, make a make kind of an idol. Put pictures up around and say, you know, this is God and start worshiping that image or start worshiping that idol or that image of God rather than worshiping God himself. And there's one place in the scripture where, where Jacob, you know, you might be thinking, well, it says no one is seeing God. But didn't Jacob say, I have seen God face to face? You remember that? Well... 
And he said, but yet my life was spared. Well, please understand that passage is quoting the words of Jacob. It is not quoting the words of God. So Jacob obviously experienced a deeply uh, spiritual encounter, probably an angelic encounter of some kind. We're not told, but we do know that it wasn't the face of God, even though he thought he did. It was so glorious that he thought it must be God. So anyway, God loved each of us enough that he sent Jesus to let us catch a little glimpse of his glory. And that's why Jesus was here. Mankind saw a bit more of the glory at the baptism of Jesus. Supernatural things going on there. The transfiguration where, you know, Peter said, okay, let's, let's build a house and put around this. Let's capture this. You can't do that. You can't put God in a house, <laughs> in a box uh, and, and keep them there. And the resurrection, wow, the power there was incredible. I mean, the whole, whole earth shook um, through, the, through these events. But we'll study those events another day. We are told, however, there's a possibility that we can see and we can experience the very presence of God. Okay? We can see God. Didn't we just read we can't? Well, the Bible does go on to tell us we can see God. It won't be captured on the 6 o'clock news or, or reproduced in a in a statue or a picture. We're not going to see a, a picture on our Facebook feed. Hey, I finally got a picture of God here. You know? Matthew 5, 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Okay? This is Jesus telling us this. We know it's true. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, that particular promise is, it can be a parallel promise. Um, there's probably some technical um, theological term, but I just call it parallel. And that is, if your heart is pure, God will allow you to see some of the things of God in your life and more of God in your life and him working in your life. And as you accept Jesus, you'll also see him after your flesh passes away. With your, you, and you can see with spiritual eyes. Human eyes, humans cannot see God and, and live. But God changes us. God transforms our bodies. We have a new body after, after we leave this planet, whether it's through, the, through uh, him taking us off, uh, or him changing us when he comes, or uh, through death experience, where uh, we're, we're converted that way into God's presence, doesn't really matter. You know, I, I know I have my druthers. I, I, I'd rather not die, because I've seen people die, and sometimes they suffer. But at the same time, if God wants to take me, I'm going to be so much better off. I'm okay with that. Um, my wife probably wouldn't like it very much, but I'm okay with that. But behold, let's look in 1 John 3, verses 1 to 3. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, we are now the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Yes, I want to see God. I want, it, I want you to see God too. I know you can do this. And the only way to do that, John chapter, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 to 7 tells us that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, yet walk in, dark, walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. Verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is how we begin our walk in that amazing grace that we've been talking about. The free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, we are told. If you're not fellowshipping with God, you can come to him. You can come to him right now. You can change your direction. Follow God instead of following your own selfish desires. Make a course correction if, if you need to. Sometimes, you know, you kind of drift a little bit. Don't wait until you've drifted way off, away from God. Get back right with God. You can confess your sins. Simply welcome Jesus in your life. God promises to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. So I encourage you to say a, say a simple prayer right now from your heart, something like this. God, I confess that I'm a sinner. I'm sorry. 
and I'm in need of salvation. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again to bring me new life. I ask to receive your forgiveness and grace. Please give me your power by the Holy Spirit to follow you each day as my Lord and Savior. Amen. Now, if you prayed something like that from your heart, the Bible says all your sins have been forgiven. God won't remember many more, and, and you are a child of God now. Once you make a decision to, to receive Christ, you know, encourage it. Get involved in a local congregation that will help you grow in the Lord by the clear teaching of the Bible um, and the clear teachings of, you know, through God's Word. Let my wife or I know that you prayed uh, maybe for the first time or coming back to the Lord, and uh, we've got some things we can send you that kind of help you out along that, help, help you with that walk. And we just love to know that God's working in your life. So um, last week I encouraged you, um, well, anyway, that's, that's the end of the presentation of the sermon. I just want to follow up on last week where we, we talked about, I encourage you to be thinking about and praying about some areas of the grounds here. If you're a regular here at Thousand Trails that we can take on a project, maybe fix, or clean up a little bit or otherwise be a blessing, improve something here on the campus. Uh, and that way we can express our appreciation for um, uh, Thousand Trails providing our space and, and time and uh, promotion and also show God's love to others uh, that will say, hey, God's people are doing something. Maybe there's something else to that. And they, they may be drawn to the Lord through seeing your love and, and your grace. So uh, be, keep, keep thinking about that. Give us some feedback. Uh, and we appreciate you being here with us. I want to bless you just as Aaron was told to bless people in Israel. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you for coming today. Next week we'll pick up the next verse. And remember, if there's anything you'd like prayer about, please see one of us at this time. Thank you.